Welcome back to Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle. We are wrapping up a full year of podcasting, celebrating our one year anniversary coming up. And so to end year one, I thought it would be fun to bring our first guest of the podcast, Rebecca Bertram, back on the show. And so we actually did a two-part series. Um, This week's episode is on having those uncomfortable conversations. And we wrap it up next week with a chat about boundaries with her husband as well, John Bertram and Jeremy. And so you'll get to hear Jeremy in both these episodes. He's back since we did a socially distanced uh, episode. And so that was fun. So join us as we talk about having those uncomfortable conversations, which are not fun, but they are so necessary. If we are going to see our stuff and share our stuff and heal our stuff, having those uncomfortable conversations are definitely part of the process. And so um, listen in as we share some things we've learned along the way. And Rebecca has some great tips. So join us as we flesh it out. Coming to you from the m M&M Exterior Studio in Knoxville, Virginia, this is Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle, the introvert's extrovert. She talks to people so you don't have to. For now. Welcome back to Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle. We are wrapping up season one slash year one. It may not technically be a season, but it's definitely the first year. We've been doing episodes every week. And so I thought, what better way to wrap up the year than to bring our first guest back? Welcome, Rebecca Bertram. Thank you. I'm so excited to be back. And I feel like it's super special that I got to be first and last. So I kind of want to be like, na 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 boo boo to everyone else. (laughs) But that would be immature. So I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying what an honor for all of us who've gotten to be on the show (laughs) that we've gotten to do it. It's been a, a blast. Oh, thank you. Well, I thought this was a great bookend. And you and I have actually been talking for a few months about what topic to do. And two common themes that have come up over and over again have been uncomfortable conversations and boundaries. And I think that it's a great wrap up to year one because so much of what we've talked about this whole year is, um, you know, I've, I've tried to encourage people to see their stuff, share their stuff appropriately. And then of course, ultimately to heal their stuff. And it sounds good in theory, but then when you actually start walking that out, let's just be real. It like sucks. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> like healing is work and it's hard and it's rough. And a lot of healing requires uncomfortable conversations. And so I thought, okay, you know, if, if you're, if you've been listening or if you're just newly listening and you go back, a lot of the conversations are meant to kind of plant the seeds or allow you to kind of find that connection finally feel seen, um, feel heard through someone else's words, but maybe start identifying areas in you that are worthy because you are worthy, but are worthy of exploring more and finding healing. Um, but I don't want to leave you hanging. So to give you a little kind of help with that, I wanted to bring Rebecca on to kind of help with that. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Well, I'm glad to be here, but I feel like before we can get into how and when and why and all of that, I think we need a story about a hard conversation. And you're so good at telling stories and I'm so good at listening to (laughs) stories. So why don't you tell us about a time where you've had to have a hard conversation, a difficult conversation? All right. So Rebecca, you know, full disclosure, asked me this earlier and I was like, well, what's on my mind a lot of the times is, you know, serious stuff because what's going on in the world. I don't want to look away. I want to keep leaning in, um, you know, with hard conversations within family and, and whatnot. But because I love like kind of the absurdity stuff and then going from there, I was thinking of, okay, what are, what are uncomfortable conversations I've had? And so I think I told this on one of the episodes in the past, but I can't remember, but one of my most memorable uncomfortable conversations was after I had had my son, my husband, so, and Jeremy's here, by the way, everybody, Jeremy's back. Woo-hoo. 
Hello. Hello. Um, so after I had my son, uh, Jeremy was switching jobs and we were going from really good insurance to really high deductible, not as great insurance. And so I wanted to wrap, like get everything checked mm -hmm. off that I could possibly get checked out and whatnot. And so, um, I don't know, you know, listeners, if you have not had a baby yet, or if you have not had a person in your life, have a baby and you're not intimately involved in that, this might be too much for you. It might change your view of me, but that is okay. So if you're familiar with having a child, you know that your body goes through certain changes. And so one of the changes, um, was I, this is a story for another day, but I had some serious constipation. And this is my PSA to everyone. Like when the doctor tells you don't push too hard, like, cause you could have repercussions, consequences. If you don't know what those repercussions are, it's called hemorrhoids. That's what's going to happen. You guys, it's going to be hemorrhoids. And so as I'm, you know, checking all my blocks, what, what procedures can I get done? Cause I've already met my deductible of my really good insurance. Long story short, I go to check out the hemorrhoids and the doctor's like, Oh yeah, you could see a surgeon to like, see about cleaning these up. So I was like, Oh, okay. So I make my appointment with the surgeon. I go and I'm super proud of myself because I'm not telling anyone about the appointment. I'm just like, this is a legit medical thing. I'm not going to be embarrassed at all. I'm just going to go and do it. And so I get there and I kept calling him the butt doctor. Cause in my head, the dialogue was like, I'm not even telling anyone I'm going to a butt doctor. I'm just going to a butt doctor and getting my butt doctor things done. And I'm not even going to make a joke about it. And so I'm sitting in the waiting room. I look over and the doctor comes out of the room and it's a guy I had met at church and his wife was super friendly and they had a kid the same age as mine and, um, hadn't ever seen them before. Hadn't seen them since, but totally met and connected and started. Um, actually I think, um, you know, I'd seen her a little bit so now I'm like, oh my gosh, that is the guy from church. So <laughs> what do I do? And so then of course I start texting my friend, like I'm at the butt doctor. So and all the maturity goes out. The oh, window. all out the window. Cause I'm like, what am I going to do now? So I'm texting like, I'm at the butt doctor and, and it's this guy from church. Cause, and then I can't ignore it because do I see him at church again? And then act like he didn't see, like, what am I going to do? So I started asking people, I asked the nurse, you know, <laughs> um, oh my gosh, I think I know this guy. Is that okay? She's like, well, what do you think he's doing now? Like, this is, he's, you know, whatever, a surgeon. I'm like, okay. So he comes in totally professional. He was great. I actually learned the difference between anal fissures and hemorrhoids. And so, um, another PSA, just, you know, you need, if it hurts with alcohol, it's a uh, fissure guys. If in, um, you just need to let it heal. So anyway, uh, save yourself an embarrassing, butt doctor visit and just kind of know that. So, okay. So this happens, he's totally professional and I move on with my life and by move on with my life. I mean, I start telling all my girlfriends about this experience. <laughs> also very professional, super, uh, you know, super professional. super professional. I'm like, you guys, you Keeping need to hear about this. Um, I knew this guy, this is so embarrassing. Well then as this becomes like funny with all my friends, I start seeing his wife more often because she starts, you know, hanging out more. We start having play dates and it now becomes this thing that I'm walking around with this super heavy thing that like, I saw your husband saw my butt, like, like I, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know. And then I felt embarrassed because I'm like everyone in the group like this, you know, we were kind of like doing this Bible study thing. I'm like, most of them have heard this story because I told it in like a fun way. And now I feel like everyone knows that your husband saw my butt except you. And so I was like struggling, like, Oh my gosh, how am I going to bring this up? This is so awkward. And so one day we, um, we ended up carpooling and I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to have the uncomfortable conversation. I'm just going to, I'm going to bring it up. Like, okay, Sam, you can do this. You can do this. So I took a deep breath and I was like, I said, you know, Hey, um, I just, I wanted to, talk to you about something. I was like, when I was pregnant with Connor, I got some like really bad hemorrhoids. And, and before I could even say anything else, she goes, Oh, well, you should go see my husband. He can take care of those. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? And so I was like, Oh my gosh. Like I was laughing that before I could even, I was like, Oh, funny. You should say that already did. <laughs> and she's like, Oh, that's great. 
And, you know, yeah, you didn't tell me because, you know, HIPAA. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. So, okay, cool. And it was just this huge sigh that I was like, I made this up to be this huge thing that, oh my gosh, when she finds out, I hope it's not awkward. I hope it's not this. And it's like, dang, when she found out, she's like, go see him. Why wouldn't you go see him? (laughs) And so um, that's like my funny, I mean, of course, there's real stuff. But like in my head, it's like, I kind of go to that, that when you think it's going to be like this horrible thing that most of the time it's not, it doesn't play out, you know, the way you think it is. Cause you go worst case scenario. It's and- true. Like you lay in bed and you have those, you have the conversations for the other person mm-hmm. in the middle of the night of all the things that it's going to be. Yes. And then you actually go do it and you're like, Oh, that was so much better than I imagined yes. it in my head. So we, we should save ourselves a lot of pain yes. and stop having long conversations in our heads that are imaginary yes. and painful and just bite the bullet and do it in person. Yes. So, um, so yeah, we think we, like you said, we lay in bed for so long and think it's going to be worse. I what kind of keeps me like going with, as we tackle like much more uncomfortable things is that like, and this is a made up quote as all quotes. I mean, as all statistics normally are, uh, 90% of the stuff you worry about is never happens. And so, you know, we always kind of go worst case scenario and it's not going to happen, but it's true. So if I can have the butt conversation with the doctor's wife, then you, we can have yes, uncomfortable can have. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So to give you guys a little backstory with Rebecca Bertram, I definitely recommend going back and listening to her previous episodes. Um, but the reason I'm here with Rebecca to talk about like kind of how to have the uncomfortable conversations is because, um, Rebecca, you have had a lot of life experience of going through traumatic events and also have the effects of not having those conversations and kind of the damage it can do. And so you, unfortunately, what is it called? Like trial by fire or something? Yes, I would say. Yeah. Have like walked through that. So you've like, maybe not choose to, but like become an expert at having the uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. It's a lot of trial and error and Mm -hmm. just getting comfortable even when it's hard. Um, So one of the things that we should talk about is when Mm -hmm. should you have the uncomfortable conversations? Because I think sometimes there's a balance. Mm -hmm. Some people make everything like everything that's irritating to them or everything that's uncomfortable. They think they need to address it Mm -hmm. right then. We don't need to do that. We don't have to address everything that makes us uncomfortable or everything that annoys us, but we do need to understand what's important in our lives and not ignore it. And I think a lot of us tend to do a lot of ignoring, pushing under the carpet because it's uncomfortable and it's, Mm -hmm. and it's difficult. We don't want to do it. But what I have found, as you kind of alluded to, is like when I didn't talk about all the pain that I was experiencing from trauma and I didn't address issues, it all started to grow and to fester. So I talk about, it's probably from a book somewhere. I don't know. I'm just going to use it like it's mine. Hey, no problem. But if you have a wound Mm -hmm. and you don't clean it out and you just put a Band-Aid on it, it's going to get infected. It's going to be nasty. It's going to be so much worse than if you've just done the uncomfortable part, because it does hurt to clean out the yeah. wound. It's, oh, yeah. oh, it's uncomfortable. You don't want to do it. But if you just bite the bullet and you just do it, then you can heal properly. Mm-hmm. But if you don't, then it doesn't heal properly and it's worse. And then you have bigger problems because of it. You know, they have to yes. chop your arm off because yes. your arm's infected, right? Yes. Let's just jump to the extreme. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> Let's gonna... just go there. Well, I mean, um, that's, and that's the thing is if people think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Like, I'm just going to sweep this under the rug. I'm just mm-hmm. going to like, oh, I'm just going to put another band aid. I'm just going to put another band aid. And pretty soon your blood is infected and it goes throughout your whole body. Yeah. Like you can't, it's, it's not poison. localized. It's just, it, it does grow. Mm-hmm. What I think Samantha is saying, death is the extreme, not amputation. Not amputation, death. death. Let's death. just go there. Oh, thank yeah. you, thank you oh, for going welcome. a little more extreme than me. It <laughs> thank makes you. Me feel oh good. yeah. Oh yeah. I can definitely you're, go there. You're there for me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, the when is basically as close as possible to the things that if something happens in your life and it's important, mm-hmm. you should try to address it as close to the occurrence as possible Mm -hmm. or as soon as you realize that it needs to be addressed instead of continuing to let it fester and continuing Mm -hmm. to wait. Once you realize, Hey, I should probably address this. Mm -hmm. Then you should make an appointment, schedule it. Yeah. Think about when can, when would be a good time to address this? And then I say, make a plan. 
Right. Mm-hmm. So you have to make a plan. So, and before we move on to the, that, that part, um, a great tip that I've heard from people is that they, uh, like with, if you're, if you're talking about with couples and you're kind of have these things to address because of course, ideally, you know, you, well, like with COVID we're coming out of this where we're having coffee together every morning and we have this lovely time where we can talk about They're things so cute. <laughs> <laughs> where we can process and whatnot. Uh, that's when you have a lot to process. You, you have that, you know, you have that opportunity, but when life is crazy and you're go, 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 you don't have that time to have an hour's worth of coffee and, you know, dig through if there's anything to talk about. And so I got a tip from a friend, which is like on Sunday night, they go through their schedules, but that's also their time to decompress anything. Like, did anything happen this week that kind of didn't get addressed and whatnot? And so it's a conscious effort that they're making of like, okay, if we can't talk about it because you know, the kids and the jobs and things like that, we're not just going to push it under the rug. So that's that's our chance to say, Hey, let's do this. And I would just throw in, don't have that conversation at 10 PM. Correct. And actually another (laughs) great tip. I mean, I get like end of the week, but you gave me the tip, not 10 PM. You're the one that gave the tip. You said you need to have a shutoff time, which is if we talk about this at night, we have the agreement. It's not going to go past like 10 o'clock or something. Which I would love to say that yeah. I'm very good at <laughs> following that, like having the shut off time. Yeah. But I mean, sometimes advice is, is good. Oh, and yeah. sometimes you follow your own advice and sometimes so, yeah. you don't. But every time you don't, you're like, oh, then, um, that's, that's why we have a shut off yes. time. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. We need to just, kinda, yeah. um, and then you pick it back up because, um, you know, you don't want to ignore it, but, uh, anyway, so yeah. I just thought that was like a great kind of way to, you can't always address everything all the time. So this is what you kind of, and also by giving a little bit of window, you also are able to process your own feelings to say, is this the hill I'm willing to die? Yeah. on? Is this something I really want to bring up or am I just feeling tired and hungry. You know, if I have a (laughs) snack, is that thing still on my mind? And yeah, it really might be. And so you need to address it. So, yeah. And I like the idea of scheduling it. Cause as you said, like, if you, like you want to try to do it as close to the event as possible, but scheduling it Mm -hmm. as close as to the event as possible, because if you just, you might've just been hungry and you might not have, or you might just speak out of raw emotion instead of not that you can never speak out of raw emotion, but it tends to be when we do that, mm-hmm. it doesn't always go. Especially if we're dealing well with some should. hard, really, really hard. uncomfortable conversations. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like if it's just kind of, you're starting to address things that like, Hey, it bothered me that you didn't, you left the, the cabinet. Open yeah. And instead of closing it. Yeah. Those are like, toilet seat exactly. <laughs> like you can trickle those things in. But if you're having a real, real deep conversation, real heavy stuff, getting into the right headspace is definitely essential, Mm -hmm. you know, and not being hungry, not being tired. Um, and then making sure that it's, um, it's all like the I statements versus the you statements. Yes, absolutely. And so like, I feel like this for, instead of you always do this, it's more, you know, coming at you. So, all right. I feel Sam that you did a great job on that. See how my I statement also still snuck in a you. We're pretty good at those, aren't they? Like I notice that I do that. I know I'm supposed to use I statements when I'm having difficult conversations, but I still like slide in. Oh, I feel like you always. I feel (laughs) like you always. I feel like you're a huge (laughs) jerk. I feel like you. The covert you. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's good. You have to watch out for the covert (laughs) you. That's actually. so we're going, so we talked about kind of when to have the conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked and, about why. And why we do it. And like kind of moving on to the hows, I think that um, the transition, I was kind of talking about the I statements versus the you statements and the, being in the right headspace and whatnot is so that we do watch out for, am I making this about them or about me? And what I mean by that is actually a little bit opposite because normally we always say we want to be others focused and all this kind of stuff. But when addressing uncomfortable things, a lot of the work I think happens before you go there because you have to think, why do I feel the way I feel? Why do I react the way I react? And when you kind of start peeling back the layers, what I have found, and I would love to get your take on this, Rebecca, is that like the difficult conversations I've had in the past where I actually feel like 
I've prepared and they've been productive and they haven't been as trivial as butt stuff. Um, <laughs> it's that I really worked through the emotions and with my pseudo counselors, as I call them to really get to, it's not about the other person. It's about me. So if there is an issue, whether it's in your marriage, friendships, family, it's, it's me, like I'm the one feeling this way. So I have to kind of unpack that. So when I go to that person, I'm not attacking them because of course, whenever we come at someone, they're always defensive. defensive. I mean, Absolutely. I am too. <laughs> right. Well, and it's funny cause I even had in my notes, own your stuff, like communicate clearly. And I had in parentheses, I statements and then mm -hmm. own your stuff. You have to own your mm -hmm. side of it. Why am I feeling this way? Am I feeling this way? Because that action, everyone would feel that way. Or am I feeling that way because it's bringing up my own insecurities or am I feeling that way because of past history that I have that's unrelated to this other person. And I'm bringing the wounds from others into this same conversation with someone who had nothing to do with that. And so like owning your own stuff, mm -hmm. I'm look at me like bleeping myself, owning your own stuff. Oh, you can say, yeah, I'm so proud I know of I'm fine right to now. More. Owning your own stuff is really important in not placing blame, but yes. at the same time, you need to be clear in stating the facts, which is kind of something we'll talk about when we get into our boundaries. Yes. Because it is, you can't, you still have to hold people accountable mm -hmm. while owning your own stuff at the same time. It's a balancing act. It is such a balancing act. Because you can't remove from them any accountability that may need to be necessary. Mm -hmm. So there are some actions that we understand are just downright unacceptable, mm. or there are certain lines that people just should not cross in mm -hmm. our own lives. And maybe those lines are there because of other things. And it's not that person's fault, but we need to still be able to say, look, I know that this line may not make sense to you because not everyone has this line, but for my own safety, because of my own history, because of my own whatever, this is a line in my life and I just need you to know that. So it's not necessarily saying, hey, you're doing something wrong, wrong, wrong. Yeah. Right. It's not placing blame, but it is saying, here's a fact. It's funny. What I was going to say actually was having uncomfortable conversations if, if there's a way that both people can do the work ahead of time. So mm -hmm. if you're on board, if you're in a relationship with someone where there's that genuine desire to both work out, whatever it is, if you can both of course do the work on your own, that's like in a totally ideal situation, which is why I also feel that everyone should go to therapy or at least yes, pseudo therapy. Absolutely. You know, if you, uh, are hanging <laughs> out with therapy, yeah, I call pseudo therapy, which I need to go to just real therapy too and pay for it. But I just, you know, when you're with, if you're not having the conversations where you're peeling back the layers before going into the uncomfortable conversations, I think that's when you can bring in so much stuff. And then a lot of conversations go south because of defense mechanisms and things mm -hmm. like that. And so, you know, if you're able to kind of peel back some of those layers, kind of get to the you stuff and then figure out what are your boundaries? What are the things that are pertinent to this person versus just not projecting stuff on this person. That's kind of your own Absolutely. stuff. And then of course the person who's hearing that to receive it and then do their own work and not just assume, Oh, this is their issue. No. Yeah. And I think it's important to, to build into the time, time to listen to the other mm -hmm. person, to be prepared ahead of time to say, like, often we go into these conversations with what we perceived how we perceived it. We all, there are facts of the X, Y, or Z happened, mm -hmm. but we are going to it with how we view the situation. So yes. it's often important. I feel like to go into it ahead of time and say, what's my goal? Is it for them to just hear me? Do, am I going to feel better? Just mm -hmm. knowing they've heard me. Is it to ask for help? I need help with understanding something, or I need you to actually help me do something, or is it to change an outcome to change a situation. So knowing that ahead helps with the planning, but it also helps to keep you from going off the rails during the conversation. Yeah. Cause you can remind yourself, is this moving us towards the goal or is this moving us further from the goal? And you can hit like a pause button. Like, yes. Oh, you know what? I've started to go down this rabbit hole. I'm talking about mm -hmm. really getting hung up on my feelings, which I, I need to process probably yes. a little bit more on my own. Can can you just talk to me a little bit about how you perceive the situation and let me hear you? That's a great tip. That kind of just opening that door for that opposite perspective, 
which often helps you to deal with your emotions some too, because you're like, oh, that person's view on this is completely different. And now I can see it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. And that really is very helpful. And Uh, yes, the different perspectives is, I think it's helpful to always hear each is each person's perspective. Cause I know just in a, um, a little bit more trivial, but with like Jeremy, since you're here too, um, talking about like just simple things like, you know, I was going to use today's example, like getting up, you know, we lay in bed and then he gets up and the moment he gets up, I shoot out of bed and we both walk to the bathroom at the same time. And it was a race. It was a race. (laughs) But this has happened before where he like would get annoyed with me. And then I'm like, why are you annoyed with me? Because I have to pee and And you're going to race to the bathroom to beat me to pee before me. And even so Tim saying that, so he's like, you're going to race me there. I'm like, no, my perspective was that I was laying in bed on my phone. And so it was like, I know I should get up. I know I should get up. So when he got up, it was like, oh, I got to get up now. So I get up and like, I'm just in what's that called? Like a autopilot autopilot mode. But today it was different because I actually, we got to the edge of the bed, end of the bed at the same time. And I saw his like defeated look of like, (laughs) she's going to do it again. Here she goes again. And I actually stopped and I was like, no, 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 you go. Because my intentions were not to race him to the bathroom. It was literally just my (laughs) own, like I need to get out. I just was avoiding getting out of bed. And finally he's out of bed. So I'm like, Oh, I gotta go. But I saw like, Oh, this is, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> can we just address the fact there's a dog there's walking a dog around. walking around my dog where he's clacking around and there are a lot of us in this house yeah. you've probably heard other noises too just, yeah we're having a happy covid19 it's gathering good. it's good it's all good um bless you dog so <laughs> so i think so anyway the whole point is we we are because we have our coffee now during covid we have a little extra time in the morning we kind of, we talked about it because it was like he has said, you know, I don't want to be annoyed. Like it's just something stupid to be annoyed about. And so I shared my perspective and he shared his and we realized like, yeah, we both are kind of projecting our own stuff into yeah, this situation. I was annoyed at, at other things that had happened, but it, the, the annoyance was there. It was just me being annoyed and then making it about something trivial. You were primed primed for annoyance. Yeah. I'm yeah. always primed for annoyance. No, you're not. <laughs> no, I'm just no, no, maybe, but hopefully not. See, I think this is just perfect examples of having, going ahead and having yeah. hard conversations. Yeah. 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 We've had some practice. Yeah. Just We've a had little. a lot of practice lately. Yeah. And that's why I can confidently say that the, one of the best advices I got kind of going into a knowing I was about to go into a very difficult season, a friend of mine, who's a counselor, shocker said, you need to get used to being uncomfortable. Yeah. And in the beginning of the talk, you said how you don't talk about every little thing that makes you uncomfortable. And I I'd like to believe that I have some social graces and I didn't talk about every little thing, but I definitely talked about a lot of stuff. So I actually was used to the over communicating and for me, and I realized too, with like humor and jokes and stuff, so much of that was relieving my own uncomfortable anxiety. Cause like to call something out because I'm uncomfortable by that and I'm not just going to sit on it. So I'm going to make a joke about it. And so I almost feel like, okay, I've had to learn to, to sit on some of that because if someone's not in a place that someone could be me, I should definitely address that. Mm -hmm. I'm not at a place to have a real productive conversation about something or, and, or the other person isn't either that I need to not say it. And I need to sit with that anxiety. Mm -hmm. And that's why I joke like, Oh, people do this all the time. They walk around, they just keep shoving (laughs) that down, you know? Um, but man, what a blessing it is when you get used to being uncomfortable, because then you have the opportunity to listen. Like you said, is that when you just take, and one of the tips, you know, you take a deep breath, you take two long, deep breaths to kind of slow your heart rate down and just take a minute to get out of your own head and listen to what the person is actually saying. And listen without thinking immediately, how am I going to respond? Mm -hmm. But listening actually to hear them is really important. I have also found that I pray a lot while I'm listening because sometimes I'll be listening to someone and we'll be like half, they'll be halfway through saying what they're going to say. And I'll realize that I don't have a good response. So I will begin to pray for God to give me wisdom. God help me to be empathetic. God help me to speak truth, help me 
and just praying for that. And it's, I don't know, maybe some people like think of it as a meditative state or yeah. things, but I'm still hearing the person, but I am, there's an undercurrent of prayer asking God and it helps to keep my levels, you know, keeps me centered. And it does help me to do a better job when I do respond. It helps me to not be quick to jump to an emotional reaction or a knee jerk reaction or a you're an idiot reaction <laughs> or it, like, yes. cause sometimes people say things, you know, in my role yeah. as a pastor. And also when I was teaching, sometimes people say things to you where you're thinking this person's like, I don't even need to give a real response because yeah. this person's clearly crazy or an idiot. Yeah. And I don't mean to say that, but people out there, some of you say crazy things or act like idiots. It sometimes happens. Sometimes I say I crazy do, things right? and act like an idiot. And you me. want to respond with, well, that's just stupid. <laughs> don't be dumb. But instead I pray, God, give me wisdom. Help mm -hmm. me. And I, you know, we've all learned in, I don't know, marriage counseling or different books or podcasts or things about those. I hear you saying what I hear you saying, but is. it's so important because mm -hmm. it's, we all need to be heard. And as you process it back out, I hear you saying it gives you time to really understand how do you actually react to that? If that is what they're saying, it just, it kind of slows the pace of the totally conversation so and really helps, but it also helps you find a common ground. So that is something, one of the things, um, when I was teaching, I often had to deal and often is maybe I'm exaggerating with the word often, but it was something that happened every year. I'd have to deal with an irate parent, mm -hmm. sometimes more than one. <laughs> and I found one of the most helpful things I could do. So one, these con these conversations were always scheduled, which is nice, Yeah. but then it also gave me time to think about what circumstance we're going to discuss. It would... I would always go in and I would start the conversation with saying, thank you for taking time mm -hmm. to coming to me. I know your time is valuable, just like my time is valuable. And let's just start on the same page. We have one goal, which is to do what's best for this student. Both of us deeply care about this kid. So if you can find out in whatever situation you're in, what is something you, you commonly would want, right? I know if it's a spouse, right? I know that you love me and I love you. And so no matter what we talk about right now, that doesn't change how we feel about each other. And we both have the goal of wanting to come to a resolution where we're both happy because I care about how you feel and you care about how I feel. So let's have this hard conversation. I want to definitely reiterate that point because when we were newly married, we were in a small group and there was a, it was all pretty much newlyweds, but one couple had been married 10 years. So they're 10 years ahead. And I remember they told a story about being at a marriage conference and when they were newlyweds and they went to the first one and they did the same activity at both. Cause they went to it like at almost 10 years and they had to look at their partner in the eye and say, you are not the enemy. And as, <laughs> as newlyweds, they did it and they're like <laughs> giggling, like you are not the enemy. Like what? That's right. so silly. And then they're like, now after, you know, 10 years of marriage, kids, there was a lot more feelings <laughs> there of like, wow. This person is not, not the, the enemy. enemy. This is my partner. But you forget <gasps> that. Like, and, and like you know, knuckles. Yes. <laughs> like, you go through things, but I think acknowledging that from the beginning is like, Hey, we love each other. And especially if you're in a very difficult time, it's like, do you got, you know, do we want to be together? Like, that's the other thing. Mm -hmm. Like if, if we're not in that we're coming from two totally different perspectives that needs to be addressed, you know? Right. But it's like, if we want to make this work, we're on the same team. You are not the enemy. So like, let's work together. Let's acknowledge that. And then of course, then you have, yeah, if you have professional relationships, kind of getting, kind of setting up the goal from the beginning. And of course we can't determine other people's feelings either, but no, can't. <laughs> Don't you wish you could? I Wouldn't it be so. great? I have control issues. I want to control everything and controlling other people's feelings would be amazing. amazing. Yeah. Would that be your superpower? Uh, maybe. I never even thought about it that as a superpower, be. but yeah. I mean, just any kind of control, right? Mm. Yeah. I mean, control is, mm. whew, it's, mm -hmm. it's my poison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I believe every person has control issues in some way. I agree. It's just you find you have Everybody's to just find selfish. the thing. Yeah. Everybody oh, wants what's ever. best for themselves. Yes. Yes. And actually, so Jeremy talked about it in his episode. Uh, 
we were talking about with therapy and growth and things like that. And it's humility, like so much of, mm. you know, working on yourself is humility. And I think that's when you're starting to have these uncomfortable conversations is to, you know, humble yourself instead of kind of looking at the other people, because we've, I think we talked about on Jeremy's episode as well about, we all think we're right. Cause if we didn't think we were right, we would change our opinion. So you have to kind of also know going into a conversation, both parties think they're right. So it's having to lay down yourself, your mm -hmm. own, you know, selfishness, self-centeredness, and kind of be in that role to actively listen, take yeah. those deep breaths. And, and I'm listening to the, the conversation you guys are having. I'm, I'm participating here and there, but the, the one big thing that I keep thinking about is you have to want to listen. You have to want yeah. to hear the other person. You can't continually think I'm right and you're wrong in a conversation, in a difficult conversation that you're trying to have. I think too, that it's important to understand some people always think they're right. And that's kind of their default to want to prove that they're right. And then there are others who think they're right but they just don't want, it's part of why you have to force yourself to have the hard conversation mm. is they might get into the conversation and then halfway through be like, it's not worth it. I'm just going to shut down now and not let their voice be heard. But it's important to let your voice be heard. It's important if you're going to go through that actual hard work of, especially in relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So my husband and I, we really went through it. We went through a season where we were not sure if our marriage was going to make it. Mm -hmm. And my husband was so glad that I was finally fighting, mm -hmm. finally mm -hmm. fighting. He was like, you're finally bringing to the table everything. Mm -hmm. And to him, that was such a relief. And I had to like work really hard to do it because in the past, I just wanted to stuff everything down, stuff it down. Mm -hmm. And then even now when our marriage was like, it's, we're not sure if we're going to make it or not. If we don't deal with this, there were still times where I wanted to still pull back and mm -hmm. not make my voice heard because it was still somehow seemed like it might be easier, except for the thing that kept pushing me forward was like, no, you're either heard and you deal with this or your marriage ends. So yeah open up your mouth and talk child. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So I think some of us need, it's like some people, your tendency is to just talk, talk, talk. Cause mm -hmm. you, and you're good at making sure that your voice is heard and mm -hmm. others yeah. have a hard time yeah. forcing yourself to do it. And yeah. so it's important to not shut down once you've gotten into the hard conversation and to keep pushing through until you come to some kind of, resolution, even if the resolution is, Hey, let's, this was a really great conversation. Let's, yeah. let's take some time to process what we talked yep. about and let's actually put on the calendar another time to come back to this exact same conversation. Cause yeah. it's not over right. To actually yes. keep doing the hard work. I think it's so important. I think, I think that's a great point. And especially the putting a pin in it type of thing because you're not ignoring it. You're not shutting it down. It's, it's making a conscious effort. Cause a great, another great tip I had gotten, I had indirectly gotten, which was when you're having the hard conversations, know how much you want to talk about ahead of time mm. and plan okay. out like the time, because it's emotionally exhausting depending on what the topic is. And then you risk that, like you said before, the rabbit holes and whatnot. And so kind of having those boundaries ahead of time, can help. And then when you start to trail off, it's okay, let's put a pin in this and we'll pick it up later. But I love the idea of you say when you're going to do it, let's revisit this sometime. And then that way it doesn't, you don't fall back. If you are someone who isn't a big talker, you don't fall back into those patterns too. So a mutually agreed upon time. Yeah. <laughs> Not we're going to talk about this in an hour. Just get ready. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> And actually, you know, as, um, before we move on too much, I think that, you know, we talked about with this hard conversations, you'll know to going into a conversation, what the feel or whatever you want to call it, the energy or something is like, if you feel that it's off, then you need to say, Let, let's wait a little bit or, and then maybe also give some boundaries or suggestions of what you can do in the meantime. Like, you know, I, w I think next time we talk, I would like to hear your perspective of this. So if you haven't had a chance to think about this yet, could you think about how that went down? So a silly example, like this morning with the bathroom, it's like, you know, Hey, 
process, you know, can you think through that? And then let's talk about it and let's see, is this a real issue or are you just kind of cranky or um, tired or is there other stuff that we really need to talk about? Like, but let's not, let's not get into this bathroom situation. <laughs> it's probably not really about the bathroom, you know? Um, so kind of that kind of taking that close to it, but not too close, mm -hmm. giving the person time, setting boundaries, setting expectations, um, and then respecting each of your communication styles too. That's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I have a side thought. I want to hear feel it. Like we've been talking about hard conversations, difficult conversations that all have to do with conflict. Yeah. But we haven't mm -hmm. talked about the hard conversations that I think was the first thing that actually made you want me to talk about hard conversations. Mm -hmm. Remember when, so Sam came with me when I got my nose pierced cause I'm having a midlife crisis and I got um, tattoos cause we're about the same age. <laughs> so at this age you get piercings I'm just going to own that. Yeah. Just owning it. Right. It's amazing. Changing I love careers it. And getting my nose yes. pierced and my kids are at a whole new stage. We're getting close to that. Everyone by this summer, it's going to be 17, 15 and 13. That's What's crazy. happening? Right. That's crazy. So anyway, Sam came with me and I got my nose pierced and I was talking with the gentleman who was doing the piercing. And one of my other friends was getting her nose pierced. And I don't know if I'm nosy or overstep boundaries or what, <laughs> but I was just, nosy. Yeah, I heard yeah, that too. Like that. <laughs> so he, um, I don't you had a relationship with him because he's, a little he's, bit, yes. he's you know, next door to our church, yeah. their tattoo shop is next door to our church. So we thought, yeah. Hey, how do you, how do you grow a church? You go get tattoos and piercings, right? That's what you should do. So I went and I knew a little bit of his story and we were talking about being afraid of needles. That's what it was mm -hmm. being afraid of needles. And he said, he got over his fear of needles by being a heroin addict. Heroin addict. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I couldn't remember which drug uses needles. Cause and I was I'm... like silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, instead of just letting the con that mm -hmm. comment pass, I asked him about it. Cause even though that could be kind of an uncomfortable mm -hmm. thing, he opened the door. So I, you know, I'm going to slam my foot into it mm -hmm. and keep same. that door open. Yes. Same girl. <laughs> like you give me and a crack, I'm getting in there. Yeah. So I asked him how he got over it and he shared that the owner of the tattoo shop had helped him to get over it. And because we do know them some, mm -hmm. I knew that the owner had just passed away. And so I asked him how he was doing with it and just listened. And afterwards, Sam was like, what, so good. how did you just do that? like just have this conversation with someone about addiction and death of someone that they love mm -hmm. and they're, they're close to. And I think that it's needing to be uncomfortable, allowing myself to be uncomfortable to allow someone else to be heard mm -hmm. is one of the easiest things we can honestly do once we start doing it. I know it's hard at say first. that again, cause that's really good. So say that one more time, oh, allowing gosh. ourselves to be uncomfortable. So to give another person an opportunity to be heard, to be heard. And I think so much of it, it's our fear of, we would say maybe, oh, I'm okay being uncomfortable. It's that, well, I don't want to make them uncomfortable. But truthfully, it's us. We're exactly. the ones who are uncomfortable. They need because if they didn't people want to, to share hear them, people to relate to what they're going mm -hmm. through, even if you can't really understand, because you know, people never know what to do with someone in grief. And I think the reason yeah. I was totally fine is because I've lived with so much grief. I've experienced yes. so much grief that I know that it's not really, if someone says to you, if, if someone just died and they say to you, how are you doing? And they genuinely are asking, it's not uncomfortable for me, the person in pain. Yeah. And if I don't want it, and if it were, I would just say, oh, I can't really talk yeah. about it right now. But if I've been just holding on to all this pain and hurt to finally have someone be willing enough to sit in yes. their discomfort of not really understanding and to just hear me would be wonderful. And that's, I think a point you brought up, which is, um, that he using this as an example, but it's mm -hmm. something that I've kind of talked about in the past too, is that when someone gives you a crack, take it, or, you know, an opportunity would be a better, but like, cause I've joked, like, so if they, if there's a cra crack, if someone gives you crack, you take Heroin. it. After this. Take it. <laughs> um, no, but if you see a crack and you're able to go there and the thing is, is if he didn't want to talk about it, he wouldn't have said anything. He He's the one that it. offered the information. And mm -hmm. because you had a little bit more knowledge of it, um, and, you were able to go there. And I just think that that's the thing is you think if people 
people are, I think are constantly crying out for help mm -hmm. in ways that don't look like saying, Hey, I need someone to talk to. It's by just making a comment like that. And when you take that extra time to, to ask, that's such a blessing because I think that it's exhausting walking around carrying stuff that you can't talk about or that mm -hmm. you feel like you can't talk about. And that's why, you know, I said with the podcast, if there's something that you're going to take to your grave, that's the thing you need to talk about. If you wonder, everyone needs therapy. Well, I don't need therapy. You probably do. If there's, you know, if you if they feel, and there's actually a therapist, she said, if there's something you feel like you can't talk about, that's the thing that we need to talk about. It's good. So I, I know we went through a lot and I found a resource. I actually shared um, something on my personal page a few days ago about having difficult conversations. So I thought as a way to wrap it up, I would use these resources. So Dr. Caroline or Car Caroline, yeah, Dr. Caroline Leaf, she had one and, and she actually, these are other people's images, I believe. Um, but I thought this is a good way. Okay. So we went through a lot of good stuff. Thank you, Rebecca, for all that. And so, um, to, as you leave this, you're starting to think about the difficult conversations. So be aware of your intention behind the conversation. That has been huge for me when people have said, what do you want to get out of the conversation? Cause there, that has saved me uncomfortable conversations that would not be productive because I was not going to get what I, you know, needed from it. And then I, of course, had to find out why I need what I need. And that goes down the hole in the rabbit <laughs> hole. So be aware of your intentions. Be clear, direct, and resp respectful. Actively listen. Identify your triggers. Stay attuned to your feelings. Make space for the other person's thoughts and experiences. So you talked a lot about that. Be curious and open about the other perspective. Acknowledge inner resistance. We talked a lot about that. Um, and take a time out when needed and take responsibility. Nice. So I thought I, I saw, I would remember I shared that. So I quick looked at it and I'm like, we talked about all those things. We did Yay, it. Go <laughs> us. So, um, you know, on a, on a serious note, um, hopefully, you know, with all of this, see it, share it, heal it. It, it is that you have to get into that uncomfortable space. But the, the beauty of that is that the more uncomfortable we get, the more comfortable we get with being uncomfortable. Absolutely. And I will say, you know, I shared a little bit that we went through the season where it was really hard. And we say again and again that we're so glad that we went through that season because it made us have the hard conversations. And we're so much stronger now and so much healthier now than we were before. And so it's that growth that occurs in the discomfort. It's so true. And actually it's, it's through the discomfort that it's only through the discomfort that the growth happens. Absolutely. And, um, I know it's funny. We were talking earlier about, <clears throat> excuse me, you said you pray during certain conversations and what had popped into my mind when you were talking about that was that when we've had difficult conversations, I, for me, it's praying. Okay. I've, I've prayed for years to God, let me have, let me be the hands and feet of Christ. Let me be the hands and feet of Christ. And, <laughs> and then he lets you do it. You're like, why? why? God, why? No, I didn't mean it like this. <laughs> I meant with, with something else that was more <laughs> selfish, you know, whatever. Um, but that has kind of helped for me with just my, you know, beliefs and whatnot kind of center me to be, get kind of out of my own way and go through those difficulties. So the other thing we say a lot is, um, thank you for the opportunity. So when we, if we are feeling uncomfortable and kind of it's our cute code word almost to each other, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity, which really means, you know, I'm feeling really uncomfortable and I don't like this, but I know that it's the greater good and that growth and healing and it's worth it on the other side. So it's good. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for joining us. Thank you for part one, doing part one. Next week, we'll be back again with part two. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm glad we could kind of be in a together, socially distance friendly, pseudo studio-ish setting. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. Definitely. We'll check us back out next week with Boundaries and Rebecca's husband, John, will be joining us. Woo! Yay! <laughs> And that's a wrap for now. Thanks for listening to Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle. Music provided by TwinMusicom.org. Song titled Night at the Dance Hall. Sound editing by me, Jeremy Spittle. A special thanks to our studio sponsor, M&M Exteriors. 
Visit their website at mmexteriors.com for all of your roofing, siding, and gutter needs in the Northern Virginia area. Visit our website at flushingitout.com and be sure to subscribe. This has been a Spitfire production. That was the greatest thing I've ever heard.